family. Good morning, family. I'm Pastor Jeremy, and I want to welcome you to worship at St. Luke's United Methodist Church this morning. Uh, we're going to start things a little differently today. It's no secret that we are led here by an amazing lead pastor, amen? Uh, pastor uh, Jen Stiles Williams, the Reverend Dr. Jen Stiles Williams, who recently got her uh, the doctorate in ministry and also was recognized as uh, one of Orlando Magazine's Women of the Year. And so we're going to start worship by joining our family, uh, joining with our family over in Contemporary via the stream uh, as Jen is honored in a very special way over there. <laughs> Matt turned my mic on before I was on stage. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. It is so good to be with you today on this Sunday, on the Lord's Day, to get to celebrate um, together as a community. Um, I want to remind you uh, that whether you're worshiping with us online or in person, we would love for you to fill out a connection card. That lets us know you are here. That lets us know any way that we can be in prayer for you and any additional way you may want to be in connection here at St. Luke's and get to know more about our ministries. Um, and so be sure you filled one of those out, whether it's online or if you're here in person, our hosts can give you a paper card to be put into the offering baskets at um, offering time. I wanted to also um, just say many of you have already heard, um, and so we wanted to thank you so much um, that the Denmark family, um, Hayden and Layton, Layton uh, many of you have heard were in a car accident yesterday. Um, the good news is they are home and fine. Um, there were, yes. <laughs> um, if some of you saw the pictures, it is a miracle. Uh, miracles really do happen, and so we are so, so glad that they are home and resting, and Jad and Shelly are with them today, um, home and helping them rest and recover as well. So thank you for your continued prayers um, for the Denmarks, um, and there will definitely be uh, some, some recovery there, so that continued support is so appreciated, all of you who have offered support and prayers and presence. So thank you for, uh, on behalf of them. I'm sure you will hear more from them in the coming weeks as well. Well, um, now, before we get started in worship, uh, my name is Pastor Melissa. I didn't share that already. Um, it's my honor to be one of the pastors here, and then you will be hearing from Pastor Jen um, later in the service. But before we get started, we have a special uh, moment to share. Um, many of you know that last week, Pastor Jen was not with us because she was in New Jersey graduating with her doctorate. Um, and we have... <laughs> And there's been much to celebrate, but we have a couple of folks who want to come and offer a little extra celebration. So Jim and Brittany, why don't you guys come up and uh, share a little bit more? <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Atchison. This is Brittany Vega. We have the privilege of serving as your uh, church council chair and vice chair. And we're here today to ask Pastor Jen to join us up on stage for a minute. <laughs> Your favorite. Yes. Yay. She loves these things. No, she doesn't love these things. We know that. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's a, a joy to be here with you all and to kind of share in this moment of recognition with, uh, with Dr. Jen here today. Uh, so what I have in my hand... Uh, this is a uh, framed copy of the Orlando Magazine in which our very own Reverend Dr. Jen Siles Williams was named one of Orlando's Women of the Year. Wow, that's so cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. It is, it's, uh, it's an incredible accomplishment for Jen's leadership uh, to also be recognized within our greater Orlando community. We get to experience it day in and day out, and the community also now gets to experience that as well. Um, amidst the pandemic, during theme park closures and furloughs and job loss and all the not cute things in between, um, Jen and the team helped to provide financial and food resources for those of us in the entertainment and hospitality industries while the world around us felt like it was crumbling. Uh, but through things like food distribution and GoPar and just general love and support for our artists. Uh, we created such a tangible impact within the community that's being recognized. Just a little summary of that here in my hand. 
Um, so we also, as a community of St. Luke's during that crazy time uh, with Jen's support and leadership, we also found new and innovative ways as a St. Luke's community to stay connected through engaging online services and innovative virtual connections and platforms. I, I think I can speak for all of us when I say we are beyond thankful for your leadership and your example of God's love within our community as well. So congratulations and thank you. We love you. It's cool, right? So cool that you Thank you. So Jen's going to need a wheelbarrow this morning because I have something else for her here. Um, as all of you are aware, we celebrated graduates last week and to much, much uh, deserved credit. One was missing who was actually walking at her commencement exercises up in New Jersey. But Pastor Jen earned a doctorate in ministry degree. That's right. She is, yeah. she is, she is Reverend Dr. Jen Stiles Williams. And, you know, this effort, when she started it a few years ago, three years ago, I think about, it was a huge, huge undertaking. But I don't think anyone, any of us could have anticipated what these next few years would be like for her with our pandemic, with um, uh, all the issues we face from the economics of the pandemic and the impact it had on our community, as Brittany talked about. But she persevered. She stayed through it. She didn't do it with alone. She had plenty of love and support from her family from the staff here at St. Luke's, but she accomplished an amazing thing. And Jen, I did steal this off the wall of your office, by the way. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I really did. But uh, Jen, congratulations from all of us. Oh, thank you. All right. you that? Thank you. <laughs> I don't, I don't, this is not my bill house. Um, <laughs> I couldn't have done any of this without an amazing staff and without you all as volunteers doing all of the work. We, I get to generate ideas and I get to release you guys to do your kingdom work and it's just an honor and a privilege. And I'm so excited because the doctorate I worked on in public theology is all culminating in Oliver this summer and what we're trying to accomplish with Oliver. And so it's just it's a gift. It's a gift to lead you all, and it's a gift to be your pastor, and it's a gift to have grown with me and my family for the last 15 years with you. So thank you so much for all your love and support, and I really appreciate being appreciated. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. Yay. All right. I'll take this. <laughs> stand for the moon. Please stand for the Call to worship. It's a gift for us to appreciate her, but I think that we always have to remember that it's truly a gift to be led by her. Amen. And so when you see her around, make sure that you continue to show that appreciation. And as uh, Pastor Melissa said, I'm sure you've all heard, well, most of you have heard that uh, Pastor Jazz boys, uh, Layton and Hayden, were in a car accident, but they're both home, as you heard Pastor Melissa say as well. And I saw them, they looked very strong. One of the things on Layton's mind was, I'm just so sorry, I won't be able to play and worship tomorrow. Uh, so you see how outwardly focused and how loving that family is and how focused they are on loving uh, the St. Luke's family. Uh, so now we're going to hear our handbells lead us in our prelude.
Amen. Now let's rise and call ourselves to worship as a community of faith. We are here in the name of Jesus Christ. Seek right now. Knock right now. Come, let us worship the one who has opened the door today. Let's remain standing for our opening hymn, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated as our children's choir leads us in scripture and in the song, Ask, Seek, Knock. Ask and you will receive. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door is opened.
Amen, amen. It's always great to be led by our children's choir. As far as this life of faith, as far as this Christianity things, uh, I think we have to admit that often children get it better than we do, amen? Amen. Let's join our hearts and our voices and our minds for our congregational prayer. God, as we approach the vision of your kingdom, give us the open hearts to discern more clearly the fruit you are calling us to bear. Help us choose your path that through narrow <laughs> invites us into an even more expansive life. Amen. Now we'll be led by a choir and above all else.
Amen. Amen. The song, um, the song went above all else, bind us in love. And I think we all know with all the things that seek to pull us in different directions today, love is the only thing that will bind us together. Amen. And I also imagine as we enter our time of giving, above all else, what are we being called to give? Is it our time? Is it our presence? Is it our gifts? Um, and I, I, I just uh, encourage us all to ponder those things as I invite our ushers forward as we observe our tithes and our offering for today.
holy God, giver of all good gifts. We ask that you would receive uh, this small portion that we give back to you and bless that it be used for your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, when I was a little boy and uh, it was Sunday morning, if my siblings and I were particularly loud, my mother was like, hey, everybody sit down and prepare your hearts for worship. And I think she really just wanted us to be quiet. But that's a really interesting idea of just taking time to prepare your heart for worship or for prayer. Um, we're entering our time of prayer and we'll be led by our choir and I want us to sing along as well, but they'll be encouraging us to ask the hard questions. And so as we hear the words of this song, as we sing the words of these songs, let, they sh let them shape and mold the way that we approach God this morning. Amen. Amen. 
With our hearts prepared, let's go before the throne of grace. God of grace, um, we come before you today believing in you, trusting you enough to ask the hard questions. But Lord, there seems like there's one that sits high above the rest. Lord, that question is why? Why so much pain in our world, in our lives, in our communities? Why so much hunger? Why so much uncertainty and violence and, and war? Lord, why? We lay these questions before your feet. At the same time, we claim to be your body. We claim uh, the reality of being your physical manifestation of love here on earth. And all of a sudden, we are faced with a mirror and the task of helping to answer these questions. The task of, uh, of, the task of, of being your body feels daunting. You um, are the source of the greatest peace there is. You are the healer when there is no doctor in sight. You are love that climbs across every boundary erected. So, Lord, empowered by your spirit, we pray uh, for our sick and our wounded that they might be healed and that we might support them in their healing. We pray for those who mourn this morning and, and that you will move our hearts to mourning alongside them in community. Lord, we pray for the broken hearts here amongst us today and in our community. Those who are waiting for an answer, a blessing, a way that seems like it will never come. Empower us, O oh Lord, to hold on to faith and to bear each other up as we strive for eternity. Lord, with all these things in mind, we now pray uh, the perfect prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please hear Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14, and it reads, Don't judge so that you won't be judged. You receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out will be dealt out to you. Why do you see the splinter that is in your brother's or sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your eye? You deceive yourself. First, take the log out of your eye, then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or your sister's eye. Don't give holy things to dogs and don't throw your pearls in front of swine. They will stomp on the pearls and then turn around and attack you. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks finds and to everyone who knocks the door is open. Who among you will give your children a stone when they ask for bread? Or give them a snake when they ask for fish. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, uh, you should treat people in the same way that you want to be treated. This is the law and the prophets. Go in through the narrow gate. The gate that leads to destruction is broad and the road is wide. So many people uh, enter through it. But the gate that leads to life is narrow and the road difficult. So few people find it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. We continue this week with the Sermon on the Mount. We continue to focus on this idea of zooming out that there are things that we may have heard again and again, and because we've heard them so many times, sometimes we miss 
really what the point was supposed to be. And that's what Jesus is doing here on the Sermon on the Mount as we have seen week after week, we have seen him invite his disciples and his followers to take a bigger view, to see the kingdom understanding of, of what God had always intended, but that over time we take God's good intentions and begin to miss the point at times, right? And so Jesus continues in this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. We're coming close to the end of this teaching, but we're not quite done yet. You see, Matthew's Jesus, again, is setting the tone for the future ministry of his disciples and helping the first church. The first church reading these words some 80 years after Jesus actually had died to help them keep their focus on kingdom goals, on kingdom purposes amidst their persecution as the early church. You see, Jesus invites us as well through these words as his disciples centuries later. He invites us to pledge our allegiance and our life solely to this new kingdom of God, zooming out from all of the rules and the laws and the work of splitting hairs to instead focus on God's will and God's heart. Now here we find ourselves in chapter seven, and Jesus gives us counsel on what seems to be, on the surface, a string of unrelated behaviors that restate the ideals of God's kingdom. He talks about judgment, do not judge so that you may not be judged. Profaning the holy, do not throw pearls before swine. Having tenacious prayer and petitions. He says, ask and it shall be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you, as we have heard throughout our service today. But Jesus takes all of that and brings it together with two really well-known scriptures that Pastor Jeremy just read. First is what we often call the golden rule, right? You may have actually learned it as the golden rule before you learned it as the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> this is one of those great passages where you can ask people, is it in the Bible or not? And you're not sure, right? <laughs> this one is. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. And then he continues, enter to the, through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. We've heard this golden rule before, and, and this golden rule that we call in our culture, this piece of the Sermon on the Mount that we call as Christians, it's found in many cultures and in many religions. This concept is almost ubiquitous in the way that we hear it throughout the world. This actually summarizes what it means to follow Jesus specifically, though. But when when we ask that question, to, to do unto others, to, to want for others what we would want for ourselves, to, to do for others what we would want done for ourselves, what does that actually look like? You know, we sang at the beginning of the service, we are called to follow Jesus. We have decided to follow Jesus. And chances are, if you are here in some way, shape, or form, that you have made that decision at some point in your life. You have decided to follow Jesus. Even if you grew up in the church, there was a point at which you may have made that, that deeper commitment for yourself in a different way. But Matthew's Gospel sets this particular passage very specifically. Because after listing the behaviors that prove our trust is in God, as we set aside the worry of worldly things, which we talked about last week, we have behaviors that prove we are living into God's will of loving others as completely as, God's, as God loves. To not judge, to see one another as beloved, to go past the law to love, to trust in prayer, and to put God first. We've got this laundry list that ends in Jesus giving the final, so what? Or as he says, therefore. And in Matthew's gospel, you want to pay attention to those therefores, because there's a therefore for a reason. 
He uses this to give us the indication that this is gonna be the last summary, that okay, let's, let's, maybe you missed some of what came before, maybe that laundry list was a little hard to follow, but here I'm gonna put it really simply for you. This is a summary of all of the previous sayings and teachings, that a life characterized by a mind and a heart surrendered to the kingdom of God. A summary of the law and the prophets tells us that the kingdom is about doing to others as you would have them do to you. It's just that simple. Tom Long, in his commentary, says that in the Sermon on the Mount, the golden rule does not stand in isolation. It no longer functions as a piece of common workaday wisdom, but as an actual saying of the kingdom of heaven. That this isn't just about our, our everyday morality. This is about truly living kingdom lives and kingdom values. It's not just a nice thing to do or a nice idea. It's actually the foundation for God's purpose in the world. And, and that's where this writer of Matthew goes even further, because he starts with that therefore, and you don't need to pay attention with the therefore, but then Matthew's writer says, therefore, in everything. In everything, he adds to these familiar words. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. You see, making this statement, Jesus ends up offering that summary of a radical new ethic of the kingdom. In everything we do, and everything we think, and everything we say, in all of the work that we do, and all the things that we create, in the way that we vote, in the way that we purchase, in the way that we empower, in the way that we vision, in the way that we hope, Jesus says, in everything. Every context we find ourselves in, every way we find ourselves active in the world, we ensure that our actions and choices treat others, all others, everyone, in ways to prove that we live by God's will and God's will alone. Now, it would be easy to also take this common saying and to make the error to hear that first person part of the instruction and center ourselves in it. But let's be clear that this directive from Jesus is not about actually how I want to be treated, with me at the center, or to think about what I can get from it. When we connect this common phrase to the kingdom of heaven, it transforms the choices and behaviors in our own lives to become visions of hope. Not our own hope, not hope for myself, but hope for the world. This rule, this instruction means that in everything we do, in all of the work that we do, in all of the choices we make, in all of the actions that we take, we have been given an opportunity to reveal the kingdom in everything. Listen to how Tom Long continues, and he describes this summary statement. It says, what does this mean for citizens of the kingdom of heaven? What do the children of God want others to do to them? Of course they want to be recognized as who they are, God's very own people, and they want to live in a world where mercy, meekness, and peace prevail. So Jesus now calls them to treat the world in the same way, to treat the world as if it were already restored, as if it were already what one day it surely will be, a place where the merciful God is all in all, and humanity is gathered at the great and joyous banquet. Why, what if we all lived that way? But this, this is why Jesus then moves to another metaphor. He doesn't stay on that, that golden rule moment for very long. He, he follows it immediately with the metaphor of the narrow gate. Now, too many times this passage about the narrow gate has been taken out of context to say that Jesus is the only answer. And for those who don't sing the song that we sang at the beginning of worship, that they have decided to follow Jesus, well, tough luck for them. But that's not actually what we see the narrow gate meaning here. 
The narrow gate is not a gate of exclusion. It's not a gate that's about in or out. The narrow gate here is Jesus' description of what a life following him looks like. That if you take everything we have already heard on the Sermon on the Mount and you take it seriously and you still, at the end of hearing all of that, want to follow Jesus, he's given you one last chance to realize this is going to be hard. Jesus is telling us that this life choice, this commitment, this allegiance to a kingdom that calls me, that calls me to be part of actually bringing about God's kingdom, to do that in the way that I act toward others, that, that is the narrow gate. Because it's easy to say I have decided to follow Jesus, but when we actually do it, when we actually face what those words require of us, when we see what the so what and the now what is, and that declaration really means, It means that if we say we have decided to follow Jesus, we have signed up for a very hard life. Now, in the last few years, as she has been completing her doctorate, Pastor Jen has spent a lot of time in New York City. Now, having also spent time um, and living in Boston, I relate to the process of getting used to living in a hustling, bustling city. The crowds and the chaos, the joys and challenges of of public transportation and subway life. Some days, if you've ever been to Boston, the the subway, the T in Boston makes this really loud screeching sound. Anybody been there recently? Um, And and when I first got there, it really jarred me, but now I kind of miss it some days. The weird things that you get attached to. But Pastor Jen was sharing that while most of the hustle and bustle she's grown accustomed to, the one thing that still causes her anxiety is getting on the commuter train to New Jersey at Penn Station. Anybody been to Penn Station? You've been in the the wide expanse. Now, I haven't made this trip as often as Pastor Jen, and the one time I had to, I was in college with a close friend who was a local, and she knew the ropes, so I just had to follow her. I didn't have to really know where I was going. Because the process of catching a train to New Jersey from Penn Station is very precise. (laughs) First, you stand and wait in a large, wide open lobby. And then, 10 minutes before your train is supposed to leave, that is when they post the track that you are to enter through on the screens. And then you proceed to one of the 15 tracks to a seat on this mile-long train. There you go, there's the, the, the they all say canceled in this picture, but um, <laughs> that would have been a different kind of challenge. So from there, you head to a track, to your track, and you move down a stairwell to the platform, and you board your train. Sounds easy, right? Pretty simple, you find your track, you board your train. But it's actually really terrible. <laughs> It's really complicated because there are so many people also trying to do this exact same thing in that 10-minute span. Hundreds of people waiting for different trains in a huge lobby, crowds more than those lobbies are intended to hold. And everyone is staring at the screens, 10 tracks along two walls, and the other five to eight tracks down the stairs. And when the track finally is listed and you know where you're going, people run like a mad dash. Not everybody's waiting to get on the same train, so you're dodging through the crowd, and you're going different directions, and you're trying to get to your track entrance. People have compared it to the running of the bulls, which I have not been to, but I can imagine. And the entrance to the tracks is then only large enough to maybe fit a couple of people, and then it's a narrow staircase and an even more narrow platform to board the train. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, or some other part of New York. (laughs) (laughs) And there are many who take it. But the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. As we read our scriptures and Jesus' teaching, 
This process of getting on a train is a little bit like heading through God's narrow gate of kingdom living. A few principles that we can take from it. First, you have to be intentional. I have to know where I have to go. I have to be intentional in every step of how to get there. And I have to do everything towards the other in love with the vision of the kingdom to be very intentional to get through that narrow gate. You don't stumble upon it. The second thing we can learn is that we have to be mindful of others. I have to see others, make room for them to get to the same destination. Not just think about myself, but to give space and grace even in the midst of my intentionality. Whew having to be mindful of all of those other people around us. But how does that change how we make our way to our train? Third, while it may feel like a mad dash, I eventually have to slow down a little bit. To stop rushing, that there is time. There is time, there is room for everyone. We can all get where we are trying to go, that we are all headed in the same direction, we're trying to do the same thing, and trust the flow. And finally, have to keep my eyes on my destination, and trust. Not get distracted, not look for shortcuts, not worry if I'm on the right track and in the process, make a little bit of room for others along the way. Can you imagine if all of Penn Station followed do unto others as you would have them do unto you? What might those crowds look like? And what might those train rides be like? Because following a kingdom journey of faith is not wide and broad and do whatever you want. The forgiveness that God gives us, the salvation that God offers us, is not salvation from, it is salvation for. It is salvation for this life of discipleship and this journey of followership, this journey of following Jesus, to be a student of Jesus, to be a citizen and pledge our allegiance to this new kingdom of heaven that Jesus is ushering in, it's a journey that starts broad, with wide open arms. But the command to follow God's will, when we really take seriously who Jesus is and what Jesus has called us to do, and we say that we're gonna follow, it begins to narrow, not who's allowed in and out, but what our options as disciples start to look like. The command to follow God's will means that the gate is narrow, the pathway gets narrow, and the path is hard. It requires every bit of our daily attention and intention to get where we're going, to get to the destination of the kingdom of God that Jesus has shown us so we can see it, we know what it looks like, we know where we're headed, and we get to help get there. We get to help ourselves get there, but we get to help the world get there. It's what we call in in Methodism the journey of sanctification. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is leading us towards, the work of sanctification to put everything we do and say and believe and think and create and work through the narrow gate of love. It's what we call saying earlier, that above all else, love is our guide Above all else, when we hear, when we hear this golden rule to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, that sounds a lot like love to me, doesn't it? To the gate is love. The gate of love means I'm more intentional about my pace and my steps. The gate of love forces me to notice others and how I'm moving alongside the path with them and how I'm creating space. The gate of love forces me to slow down and to not run others over, to not become an obstacle to someone else. The gate of love makes me trust that the destination is not my own, but it's Jesus, and that there's actually room for all of us 
on the journey toward him. This journey of the narrow gate, the narrow path, the harder journey that leads to the broad, inclusive, full of life and full view of God's kingdom. God's wide, expansive kingdom that is for all and includes all. And by us as disciples taking the narrow path, we create a broad welcome for the world. All because we have chosen the narrow way. I have decided to follow Jesus. When we sing that, we have said, I have decided to take the narrow path. I have decided to do unto others as God has called me to do, all so that I might be part of the kingdom that is grounded in love. And I would say that's a pretty good reason to make that mad dash. (laughs) No turning back. No turning back. So how about we sing that again? How about we sing again what we have decided? And I I wanna invite you to change those words to we have decided because the encouragement on that narrow path, when we say I'm gonna take the harder road, part of the reason we come here each week is to know that we aren't taking the hard road alone. That a life of discipleship is a life in community, and that while the path may be narrow, there is room for us all. So let's sing together, we have decided to follow Jesus. Can we first have a hand clap of praise before we end our time together for the way that God has been moving through music, through our choir, through our handbell choir, through our instrumentalists, through our children's choir. Also, Pastor Melissa preached about, no, I'm not, don't worry. I'm not gonna do nothing to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she got real nervous. But Pastor, Mel- nah, nah. but Pastor Melissa preached today about the narrow gate. And if this was the first time this week that you were hearing those words, then you're not getting all of what we're offering as far as what it means uh, to follow Jesus and grow in discipleship. So I want to remind you that throughout the week, uh, our our rhythm of discipleship starts on Sunday night. So tonight with our church-wide Bible study on Zoom at 630, then continues with our podcast on Monday, and then concludes on Sunday morning. We have decided to follow Jesus. I hope that those words are words that are maybe working on you. Maybe you made that decision a long time ago and are needing to to repeat those for yourself. Maybe, Maybe you're not sure if you're ready to decide yet, and that's okay. 
but know that when you make that decision, you've, you've made a decision mm. to take a path that's not going to be easier <laughs> and yet is so full of life. So now go knowing that as you have decided or are deciding to follow Jesus, you do not go alone. You go with community, the community of one another, and the community of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So go knowing you are empowered and gifted and called to be all that Jesus has called you to be, to be true disciples who walk the path that leads to life. Amen and amen. Thank you.